Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this Onc Live Peer Exchange panel discussion on the topic of advanced renal cell carcinoma sequencing therapies. As progress in the field of renal cell carcinoma research continues to generate new therapies and longer survivals, we are faced with new opportunities and challenges with respect to optimizing treatment for each patient with this advanced disease. In this Onc Live Peer Exchange, a panel of experts will discuss the latest information on how to incorporate and sequence novel agents as part of an individualized therapeutic approach. My name is Dr. Robert Figlin, and I'm a Steven Spielberg Family Chair in Hematology Oncology, Professor of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences, Director for the Division of Hematology Oncology, and Deputy Director of the Samuel Ocean Comprehensive Cancer Institute at Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California. Participating today on our distinguished panel are Dr. Daniel George, Professor of Medicine and Surgery, and the Director of Genital Urinary Oncology at Duke University Medical Center in Durham, North Carolina. Dr. Thomas Hudson, Professor of Medicine and Director of Genital Urinary Oncology Program at the Baylor Salmons Cancer Center in Dallas, Texas. Dr. David McDermott, Associate Professor in the Department of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, Staff Physician of Hematology Oncology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and Leader of the Kidney Cancer Program at the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center in Boston, Massachusetts. Dr. Elizabeth Plimack, Director of Genital Urinary Clinical Research and Associate Professor in the Department of Hematology Oncology at Fox Chase Cancer Center, Temple Health in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And Dr. Nizar Tanir, Professor and Deputy Chairman in the Department of Genital Urinary Medical Oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let's begin. So Elizabeth, let's start with you and, and just set the stage. Patients present with oftentimes a kidney cancer, whether it's early stage or later stage disease. And one of the things that, that our colleagues would like to know is what you think is the role of biopsying that mass, um, if a person is definitely going to go to surgery. So help us understand the role of biopsying a primary mass in, in RCC. Sure, so I think the key distinction is whether they have metastatic disease radiographically or not. Certainly if they don't, we want to optimize their chance for cure. And there, if the lesion meets radiographic criteria, often we don't need a biopsy. The lesion really should come out in order to determine what it is and give the patient the best chance. So in that setting, I think it's more straightforward. In the setting of metastatic disease, it's been our convention to perform cytoreductive nephrectomy to remove the lesion, the primary lesion, and then start systemic therapy. I think that's based on old data that showed a survival benefit to that approach. We don't know if that's true now, but I would argue that going for surgery and sort of skipping the biopsy gives a couple of advantages. One is we get true pathology from it, Biopsies can be non-diagnostic or discordant. Um, and the other is it, it spares the patient any local symptoms from that mass that may come on down the road and cause problems. Thank you. So let, let's extend that a little bit and say we have a newly diagnosed patient with advanced disease. Uh, it's biopsied and we know that it's kidney cancer. And we'll talk more about the heterogeneous types of kidney cancer in a future discussion. How do you decide when to begin therapy and what goes through your mind when the patient's in front of you and you are faced with metastatic disease in an untreated patient, helping to make a decision about start now versus start later, how do you think about that? Right, so I think the key is if you have the opportunity to really try to judge the pace of their disease. Either look back at old scans to see how their disease has evolved, or if their initial diagnostic scan was older, and often it is, just get another one right before you start. We have patients where we've been set up to start treatment, but we get that scan and the disease is stable. Those patients can enjoy a period of time off of treatment without any side effects from treatment. I think the caveat is if you have a patient who's symptomatic from their disease, if they have a lesion in a location that's threatening a critical structure or Organ, those are the people you're going to want to start sooner. And then it's also patient discussion. Some people really just want to be on treatment. Some wish to avoid it for as long as possible. So just in a, in a ballpark, what percentage of your patients do you think, you know, over the course of a year, you actually watch for a period of time before initiating systemic therapy? So we actually looked at that as part of a clinical trial. And I would say it ended up being about 10%. It's, it's generally a lot of patient 
um, physician selection bias and sort of gestalt, but yeah, it's about 10% who can get away without treatment. Dan, some thoughts? Yeah, you know, I, I think this is a really interesting area because um, this isn't represented in our clinical trial population. That's For the right. most part, most of our trial data that we have that we base a lot of our information on is patients who are starting on systemic therapy. So this space sort of before starting systemic therapies is somewhat sort of uncharted. We've actually looked at it in the context of a prospective registry and it actually turns out to be about 25%. Oh, great. Okay. And Even one of the interesting things I think that's sort of coming out of that is predictors for this and it seems to be volume of disease. So in addition sort of pace, I would say patients with really low volume disease are sort of the other ones and you know you guys can chime in. I mean these are the patients you look at little tiny lung nodules hey, can we wait a few months to look at them and, you know, consider maybe a delayed therapy approach? Right. And those are the lesions that tend to be less symptomatic mm -hmm. and less threatening. So, so David, one, one question for you. Um, do we risk them benefiting from therapy by waiting? As far as I know, there's no evidence of that, meaning I think patients with symptoms may do worse, but as long as you're intervening before that develops, they should do just as well with most of these treatments. It's a hard conversation, though, to have, as Betsy was saying to patients, particularly when they get to you, they're often anxious, motivated to do something. Why aren't you going to do something, doc? All that kind of stuff. But to me, I, what I try to explain is that for many of these treatments, they'll it, it help you live longer, meaningfully longer, uh, on treatment, but they almost always eventually stop working. In individual patients like yourself, we don't know how when that's going to be, but the sooner we start, the sooner we get to the point where we're going to need to do something else. So I try to tell them if we wait to start, that puts off the time where we're going to need to do the next thing. And that gets many people to agree, but not, it's not for everyone.